May 10th of 2002, it was a Friday afternoon. I had spent all day with my friends. We came to this bar, one beer had led to another, and next thing you know, the lights in the bar were coming on and it was two o'clock in the morning. I just kind of figured that I would be okay. Went right out to the truck and jumped in. As we went into this curve, the Camaro on my right, it all of a sudden starts to merge into my lane. So I just instinctively jerked the wheel. I never even saw the car that had pulled into the inside lane. When I came to, in the midst of all the airbag smoke and the radiator hissing, glass was everywhere. An officer comes over and he was like, what happened, what happened? He asked me, have, had I been drinking? I told him that I had. And at that point, the lights are coming on and I'm seeing this car and I'm seeing people frantically working around the car. And I see them actually bring white sheets out and I'm thinking to myself, what's really going on here? And they said, you don't want to be responsible for this. And I said, responsible for what? And that's when he looked at me and he said, there's two girls that are dead in that car over there. To take responsibility for the death of two 20-year-old girls who had their whole life ahead of them, I didn't want to be responsible for it. I didn't know what life from that moment forward would ever offer me ever again. I was a 24-year-old kid facing a minimum of 20 years, and I was scared. They said, you can't look at the families. You know, I said, well, I need to say sorry to them. And they said, you can't say you're sorry. And I said, what do you mean they lost their kids? They lost their daughters. And they said, well, listen, if you want 20 years in prison, then you go out there and you tell them you're sorry. And just go out there and sit at the table and pay attention to the papers on the table or the judge. That's what I did. Here I was in this very dark world, and my mom drops the Bible off, and I'm thinking to myself, it's probably too late for me. And that's when another inmate comes over and he starts talking to me. He said, do you believe in, in God? And I said, well, you know, I believe in God, but I don't really think he wants to have a relationship with me right now. And he said, well, that's where you're wrong. We started reading the word a little bit, and that's when I came across Genesis 50, 20. They intended to harm you, but God intended it for good for what is being accomplished, the saving of many lives. When I first read that scripture, it gave me a lot of hope. The chaplain came by, we went down to a holding cell, and I gave my life to Christ. On October 3rd, I was brought back to court for sentencing. Hearing each person come up and talk and address the judge and me, it was heart-wrenching. And then Renee, Megan's mom had the ability to look over to me and say, I forgive you. Here was this mother who lost her daughter looking at the guy who took that from her and saying that I forgive you. I was so young in Christ at that point that there was still some doubt. Are you sure, God, that you can still accept me? Are you sure that I can be forgiven. And then she spoke it. I just, I fell apart. <laughs> I'm really sorry to the families for what I've done. <laughs> I've caused so much pain. There's nothing I can do. <laughs> I've asked God to help me. And he has, but that's not gonna bring Megan and Lisa back. I wish I could. <laughs> I would give my life. I would honestly give my life. I wrote him letters, and I made a phone call to Megan's grandmother, and she told me that Renee was there. I knew in my heart that it was my fault. I needed her to hear me say that. And so I told her, I said, Renee, I just want you to know that I take full responsibility for what I did that night. It was what she needed to hear. In August of 2006, we come into this courtroom. It was a very brief hearing. It's called a beggar's motion. No law is discussed. You simply beg for mercy. These families had come to a motion on my behalf. 
you would expect my family to do that, but then the families, Megan and Lisa's parents and brothers and sisters, and aunts and uncles, it was like, holy cow, they're supporting that. Even if the judge says no, the blessing's already been given. And the judge came back. He said, on recess, I read something, and it was in Micah 6, 8. O oh man, what does the Lord require of thee? But to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. He said, I have never in my life seen anything like this. Mr. Smallridge, these families have come here to try to give you a second chance at life. So I'm gonna run these sentences concurrent. Megan and Lisa, if I could say one thing to them, it would be that they were God's angels being used for a purpose, that their lives are just as magnificent now as they were then, that they are still affecting people's everyday life. Without receiving forgiveness, you can't move forward. There is no hope. If we don't forgive self, or receive forgiveness from the things we've done in our past, we have to still accept it from Christ and to know that as long as we turn away from those actions and as long as we walk the walk that is approved in God's eyes, that we are truly forgiven.